Euronet Plus Panorama is a weekly review of European news broadcast by our network of EU radio stations. Hi, I'm Jo and you're listening to Euronet Plus Panorama. All too aware of their country's vulnerable position on the fringes of Europe, tens of thousands of Moldovans took to the streets of Chisinau last weekend. Meanwhile, the EU's proposed new Russian sanctions cause a stir on the global stage. Sunday's rally in the Moldovan capital took place at the behest of the Moldovan president, Maya Sandu, who accuses Moscow of trying to destabilise her country by fueling anti-government propaganda. The demonstrators, who were voicing their support for their pro-European government, also called for the Moldovan constitution to be amended to explicitly include the country's European trajectory. Addressing the crowd, Sandu said that she wanted to work towards a European Moldova, specifically a Moldova with strong and reliable friends. Radio Romania shares her comments. Moldova's place is in the European Union. Our country project and goal is for Moldova to be, by 2030, a full member of the European family. This is not just my commitment. We have the support of the European Union on this path, and this is what the people of Moldova demand. They have asked for it every time they have taken to the streets to defend their rights. They have asked for it in the elections. They are asking for it now when we have once again come together to decide the fate of Moldova. Europe is more than just a political slogan. Europe is a way of life, a dream that must become reality, and it is the chance for our people to live in peace, tranquility and prosperity. European Parliament President Roberta Metzola was also invited to attend. She had some words of encouragement for the assembled masses. You choose Europe and Europe will welcome you with open arms and open arms. The rally was strategically timed to take place just ahead of next week's European Political Community Summit in Chisinau, which brings together the leaders of the 27 EU member states with those of 17 other European countries to discuss issues related to Europe's security, stability and prosperity. On Wednesday, Metzola doubled down on her message of openness towards Moldova in a conversation with our colleagues at Latvia's radio. And my message to Moldova when I was there and I addressed an 80,000 strong crowd of pro-European Moldovans who were asking Europe to let them in. And my message to them, in preparation also for the European political community, where we will all be there again next week, was very clear that for every country that looks at Europe as its home, then Europe should open its arms, because otherwise those countries might be tempted or subverted to look elsewhere. And that's a reality that we live today. And it's also one that I think we should not take for granted, the power of transformation that European Union brings. Green MEP Marketa Gregorova agrees that maintaining Moldova's current geopolitical orientation should be the EU's primary focus, not its financial and trade relationships. And this despite the fact that she authored the Parliament's report on financial support for Moldova, which was voted through in April. Gregorova is talking to our colleagues at Luxembourg's 100.7. So from my perspective, the biggest challenge and goal for the EU should be to secure Moldova and to help them like really strengthen their resilience and democracy as soon as possible, because otherwise we will lose uh, the current government or I don't care or no one is talking about the current like party, but they're pro-European direction, so to say, you know, and to create more resilient society. So when there are attempts from Russia to make certain coup d'etat or spreading propaganda disinformation, the society does not believe it or does not believe it as much to really change their direction from the EU. Because if we lose this, then it's not about trade, you know, because then Russia overtakes. Yet for Romanian EPP member Siegfried Murashan, a member of the EU-Moldova Parliamentary Association Committee, which brings together MEPs and Moldovan MPs, there is no prospect of Moldova joining the Union, while its Transnistrian region continues to be occupied by Russian troops. 
This said, Marushan tells 100.7 that he does not believe this should stop the EU working with Chisinau to ready the country for accession. Ich glaube nicht, dass die Republik Moldau Mitglied der Europäischen Union mit russischen Truppen auf ihrem Territorium in der Transnistrie. I do not believe that the Republic of Moldova can become a member of the European Union with Russian troops on its territory in Transnistria. We will need to solve this problem before accession. We do not yet have a solution to this Transnistrian problem. It will, of course, also depend on the outcome of the war in Ukraine. But the fact that we do not yet know the solution to the Transnistrian question should not prevent us from taking the next steps with the country in areas where we can do so. For example, trade, the environment, agriculture. In all these areas we can work with Moldova on its adoption of European standards. Meanwhile, according to Baholsky Radio's Brussels correspondent, Beata Puameka, a preliminary agreement was reached at Monday's Foreign Affairs Council to extend EU sanctions to several individuals accused of destabilizing the situation in Moldova. Both Russian and Moldovan individuals are to be sanctioned. According to earlier information, the blacklist I have seen includes pro-Russian oligarchs acting on behalf of the Kremlin to undermine the pro-Western government in Chisinau, namely Vladimir Plotniuk and Ilan Shor. In addition, a Russian businessman who is bankrolling the security services orders to destabilize the situation in Moldova. Sanctions banning entry to the EU and freezing assets in Europe will also hit several Moldovan politicians. The imposition of these sanctions was possible thanks to a legal framework agreed on by the European Union a month ago. And by EU standards, the blacklist was pulled together very quickly, because when member states approved the legal framework for sanctions for human rights violations or cyber attacks, it took a year for specific individuals to be blacklisted. Pormeka reports that ambassadors are expected to confirm the decision imminently. And of course, EU sanctions against Russia are once again in the news this week, following discussions at the Foreign Affairs Council. With Moscow still managing to obtain sanctioned technological goods from Europe for military use, Brussels has made stopping Russia circumventing the existing sanctions the main objective of the 11th sanctions package. But this is a thorny issue. Will the bloc really dare to crack down on countries that help Russia get around the sanctions? The European Commission is proposing three measures as part of its new package. The first is to tackle so-called false transit, where goods ostensibly intended for civilian use leave Europe via Russia for other third countries, but they never make it to their end destination. The second measure targets the unusually high trade flows between the EU and certain third countries, such as China, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, Armenia, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, for instance, has seen its European car exports almost treble since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, reports RTBF. These countries are suspected of supplying goods to Russia and could see their trade with the EU slashed. The third measure targets foreign companies believed to be supplying embargoed goods or components to Russia. Berlin in particular has thrown its weight behind a crackdown on such companies, which could lead to their European assets being frozen. In an interview with Bulgarian National Radio, EPP member Andrei Kovachev backs this proposal. If the companies are entirely private and not linked to the state and are carrying out this activity circumventing the sanctions against Russia on their own, this proposal makes a lot of sense, particularly companies that are in the European market or want to be. It would be a serious blow to them to no longer be able to operate economically in the European market, including by the freezing of their assets in the EU. This would be very effective. We have been saying this for a long time. The problem is that we have not been effective with our policy and we have been very slow in dealing with Russia's economic presence in the EU, whether it is private individuals linked to the regime, private or state-owned Russian companies or city administrations. Let me cite the example of the government of Moscow, which owns property in Bulgaria. 
което има също собствености в, и в България. When the US previously threatened to sanction European companies that continued to trade with Iran, Europe objected vociferously. Targeting other countries with sanctions aimed at Russia would therefore represent a bit of a U-turn for Brussels, as honorary ambassador of Belgium, Raoul Delcorte, tells RTBF. A while ago, as you will recall, we were pointing an accusatory finger at the US and saying, how dare you use these types of sanctions? Yet, if I have correctly understood the President of the Commission's statements, we are now working on these types of sanctions ourselves. In other words, we are going to penalize third countries and third-party companies, and we are going to apply European law and European sanctions to a third party. And in any case, some commentators doubt that the EU has sufficient economic clout to implement these kinds of extraterritorial sanctions. Clément Fontan, professor of European economic policy at Belgium's UC Louvain, for example. The question arises as to the capacity of the European Union to put these extraterritorial sanctions in place. Because, unlike the case of the United States, the euro, the EU's currency, does not play as central a role in the world as the dollar. And it is this, in the end, that allows the US to apply these sanctions, given that the vast majority of large commercial transactions are carried out in dollars, and that today it is unimaginable for a financial player not to have access to American banks that convert the dollar. The euro is less essential than the dollar, and European law is not the same as US law. So it is hard to see how the euro could be used to implement these sanctions, unlike for the US. Although the package is still a draft, rumours of this new policy are already ruffling feathers on the global stage. During a visit to Berlin, China's foreign minister made no bones about it, If this were to happen, China would react strictly and firmly. And this is not the only issue dragging out the sanction talks, says Polsky Radio. Polish Foreign Minister Zbigniew Rao has admitted that new demands from member states are also causing delays. Poland itself wants to expand the proposed blacklist to include more people responsible for kidnapping Ukrainian children and taking them to Russia for forced adoption including individuals and companies in Belarus, he explains. There have also been demands on our part that those responsible for persecuting the Crimean Tatars and, of course, for deporting their children should definitely appear on this list of sanctioned individuals. The will to finalize this 11th package of sanctions is there, but there seems to be a lack of decisive leadership for drawing things to a close. There are new issues arising linked to the situation in the lands occupied by Russia. That is why this list of expectations is swelling. With the sanctions package requiring unanimous approval by member states, the Commission certainly has its work cut out for it. Negotiations are ongoing. So that brings our podcast to a close. Make sure you come back next week for another look around the Euronet Plus network. (laughs) 